Um, okay, uh, thanks all for coming out. I'm very happy to have Swati Singh here to uh, give a talk. Uh, Swati survived her undergrad at McMaster despite a TA named William Koish, survived her master's at UBC despite a TA named Tammy Farag Barnia, and uh, did her PhD with Pierre Meister in Arizona, uh, became an ITAMP postdoctoral fellow with Susan Yellen at Harvard, and is now a professor at the University of Delaware. Uh, she's also won the Cavley Institute Theoretical Physics Scholar Award and an NSF, uh, NSF Career Award. I know her for her work in AMO and optomechanics, but she also does some work in solid state qubits and superfluid helium, and lately has been focusing on this interesting idea of trying to detect dark matter with uh, mechanical systems, and that's what she'll talk about today. Swati. Hi. Well, thank you for the introduction. Jack, can everyone hear me just to confirm? Okay, thanks. Um, so I can't see um the chat screen because i'm on full screen mode but if you have some small clarification questions please feel free to interrupt and uh, ask me otherwise i'm available after my talk to answer questions um thank you again for the um, invitation and i'm quite excited to talk to you about the new work in my group about using mechanical systems to ex uh, to look for dark matter and dark energy. Oh my God, this is not working. Um, okay. Um, okay, so um, I want to start with, so I come from quantum optics and AMO, so I want to start with some of the smallest things that we have measured so far. Uh, we know time to 18 decimal digits. Uh, we can measure really weak magnetic fields um, at or Tesla weak using atomic systems. We can measure really weak forces by monitoring some trapped ions or atoms sloshing around in optical traps. We can routinely measure about uh, zeptometer displacement sensing, so about 10 to the 21 meters um, of displacement sensing and um, yoctogram masses. And uh, I'm a theorist by training, so I like to categorize everything. And you would find that many of these are either spin one half systems or harmonic oscillator systems. In fact, pretty much um, my advisor used to say that there are only two types of physicists, spin one half physicists and harmonic oscillator physicists. So you probably know which one you are. Um, and it's because we kind of you know, we, we solved many problems by mapping it to spin one half, which captures energy uh, transitions and coherences between two discrete levels or harmonic oscillators, which captures small changes around some equilibrium state. And uh, but it's not just that we can also think of them as sensors. So, for example, the energy difference in a spin one half system is very susceptible to weak um, magnetic or electric fields, and this susceptibility makes spin one half a very good sensor of its environment, and we use it in NMR, MRI. Um, also, um, in a similar fashion, um, the you know, if you think of mass on spring system harmonic oscillator, the equilibrium position is quite susceptible to external forces acting on it. And it's not a problem, it's a feature. We use it for LIGO or we uh, use it for AFM, atomic force microscopes, where you have a floppy cantilever and it moves around uh, because of external forces um, that are due to your sample. Okay, so uh, despite you know, all the significant digits we know these uh, physical quantities do, we still don't know over 95% of the universe, which is composed of dark matter and dark energy. But, you know, we have a name for it. So one, so I've been inspired to use these very sensitive um, devices to look for these things. And uh, it is worth kind of stepping back and asking ourselves, well, how do we know about the dark sector, which is dark matter and dark energy combined? Um, there are two ways to do that. We can either look outside, so use better and better telescopes and have better astrophysical surveys. And it is definitely a line of research. And in fact, everything we know about dark matter and dark energy is from astronomy. 
we don't or yeah you could look inside what i call look inside design direct detection experiments to probe the very weak coupling between um beyond standard model particles that could be dark matter or dark energy and normal matter so we have some normal matter basically that is very well isolated these are typically big experiments like the xenon 110 experiment cdmx admx um or you could design some small uh, tabletop precision measurement experiments to probe the very weak coupling between the dark sector and normal matter. And uh, in this talk, I will um, mention some tabletop experiments that could lead to new constraints on dark matter and dark energy that are made of harmonic oscillators, because I'm a harmonic oscillator person. Um, so it is uh, just a mass on spring. Um, that where its motion is being read out using light. These are typically cavity optomechanical systems. There's a whole range of devices that could be pendulum mirrors of LIGO or a couple of atoms sloshing ar around in an optical cavity. And uh, such systems have amazing force acceleration or strain sensitivity. And I want to use them uh, apart from resonance enhancement. And so I want to you know, talk about using them to, to look for, in general, beyond standard model physics. OK, so I was told to give a bit of an introduction to dark matter and then re more recent work on dark energy. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of build up what I mean by the dark matter signal or ultralight dark matter signal and how to detect it. So please feel free to ask quick questions because I know there's people from different backgrounds. And also please feel free to add to the discussion. Um, okay, so let me start with the dark matter problem. About 23% of the universe is made of dark matter. It's about 85% mass in typical galaxies, but we don't know how this mass is distributed um, very well. It could be the right sprinkle of um, black holes and white dwarfs and brown dwarf, although a lot of this parameter space has been ruled out by weak lensing surveys. Um, it could be something smaller, like I call it object-like dark matter. Um, it could be particle dark matter, like WIMPs or sterile neutrinos, or it could be a wave-like dark matter, <coughs> which is QCD axions. Um, so I, I like to look at this cartoon and uh, to explain what, depending on how this mass is distributed, you will have to think about uh, designing an experiment differently. So astrophysical simulation suggests that there's about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube of dark matter, which is about a proton per centimeter cube or over the size of the Earth. It is about um, 100 grams of dark matter. And so the question is, how is this 100 gram distributed? Uh, we don't if it is indeed in a hundred gram, you know, squirrel size object, then the question because then you can use your weighing machine to look for it. We can detect such dark matter with primarily its gravitational coupling. But then the problem is what is the probability that such dark matter is sitting on top of your weighing machine? You're looking at a very rare event. On the other hand, if this mass is distributed into particles that are much um, lighter than the mass of a neutrino, then you would, you know, given 0.3 G, GV per centimeter cube, then you just are sitting in an ether or a fine mist of these particles, and you have a signal that is everywhere at all times. So you can build a resonant amplifier for a signal like this. However, you will not be able to see it purely from its gravitational effects. You can't really do GMM over R square for things that are much lighter than a neutrino or anything close to that. And so, um, so given this kind of distribution of masses for wave-like dark matter, one can build a resonant amplifier of continuous signal. For particle-like dark matter, we kind of build either single phonon detectors or weak recoil detectors. And for astro candidates, we build a gravitational wave detectors. And uh, it, my little cartoons show that <laughs> in principle, you can use a mechanical mass on spring system in all these modes 
to look for such dark matter. In fact, um, mechanical systems are already being used to constrain dark matter. Uh, LIGO has um, LIGO black hole merger surveys have constrain black primordial black holes as a dark matter candidate and the statistics of these constraints have been challenged so it's an interesting area of research um, levitated microspheres have been used to constrain object like and particle like dark matter and there's a whole range of um, tabletop experiments they are primarily cavity based searches to look for wave like dark matter so to look at like weak changes in position usually. Um, so I will focus on using optomechanical systems as a resonant amplifier of this continuous signal that is because of dark matter. So because, or what I thought uh, was that most people here are from a condensed matter background, I'd like you to think of a possibility that you, me, and everybody we know are all swimming in possibly a galactic scale BEC. Now, how would you know that that is indeed the case? You know, what kind of experiment would you design? So in these kind of um, systems where you have, when the mass of dark matter particle is uh, less than one EV per, you know, over C square, C is one in particle physics, so people just say one EV. Um, dark matter must be bosonic particle, just because the Fermi um, velocity would be higher than the galactic escape velocity. Um, for these dark matter particles, we don't know the mass of this particle, but they there is enough number density that they're going to start to, at least over the scale of your detector, they can be modeled as a coherent wave. So you're looking for a field that is kind of like cosine omega t. You don't know the omega because you don't know the mass. Um, we don't, the amplitude is related to the local dark matter density, which is about 0.3 GV per centimeter cube. And uh, the k dot r, the k is, re is, about, is related to the speed at which dark matter is moving in your frame. So, you know, if, the, if this is the galaxy and we are moving, you know, we are here and we are moving like this, we're moving at 10 to the minus 3C and your detector is moving there and you're just sitting in this cloud of dark matter. So we, so the K dot R comes from, from that effect. Um, and uh, this cosine is not cosine forever. There's a coherence time associated with it. One can think about it as a Maxwell-Boltzmann-like distribution. Um, it's part of the standard halo model, but this is a good way to think about it. And, um, and so um, there is a coherence time associated with this Doppler shift of velocities, and that's about a million oscillations. So we don't know the frequency of this cosine signal. We just know it's a cosine for a million oscillations, and then the phase flips. Um, so a couple of things about this signal, if you think about it, it's always there because you are like swimming in it. Um, it's not like it's not here, it's here. It's, uh, a sig it is a nice um, narrowband signal, and it's locally coherent for a million oscillations. So one can think of a variety of quantum systems to look for something like this. I want to expand on ultralight a uh, dark matter signal for people who are a bit uninitiated into it. So something that really helps me creatively, and uh, this is my slide for the students or students at heart, I want you guys to think about if you were blind and I told you there is this amazing particle called photons and we're all swimming in it, um, how would you convince yourself that photons exist? So I think like I'm gonna like give 10 seconds to people to think about it because I also can't see the chat window and stuff. Okay. Um, okay, um, any ideas? I guess people aren't writing it in the chat, but you can feel oh. it on your skin. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, hope it was heat. Yes. Good. 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 Okay. So, so what you said 
is a direct detection method, uh, Aiden. So let me, oh my God, what did I do? Um, okay, this is why, okay. So there are two ways to look for the photon. Either we think of photons as a real particle and wait for them to directly do something measurable, which is what you suggested. You look for heat. You look for, for example, like photoelectric effect would be an example of that. Or you think of photons as virtual particles that mediate forces. So I try to do a very uh, precise measurement of Coulomb's law. And I'm like, oh my God, there is this force. So there must be a particle associated with it. And that's a photon. So this is like an indirect um, measurement uh, that tells me that there is a particle called a photon. And there are you know, clear examples of these kind of detectors. So for um, um, dark matter, a direct detection example, would be uh, the haloscope experiment, xenon one, one ton, or like pick your favorite noble gas detector, um, all kinds of um, accelerator experiments. You, you're looking for um, a, a direct, um, to directly detect a photon. Um, and the second one would be, in the second category, an indirect detection method would be uh, EP tests, so a yeah, better and better measurements of uh, fifth force, tests of fifth force equivalence principle violations that kind of constrain these new forces that would be mediated by new particles, which may be dark matter or um, not. <laughs> Wait for the detector to tell me. Yeah, so <laughs> in the first case, yes, we are waiting for the detector to tell you. One cool thing is like if you think about the Coulomb law um, example, it doesn't matter whether you do this experiment at day, um, you know, it, it, day or night. Um, so it doesn't matter what your local photon density is. Um, you will still see a force and you can constrain, um, or actually in this case, you're not constraining, you'll know that there is this thing called photons. So these are the two style of experiments that one designs to look for, in general, like ultralight particles or any like new particle that is beyond the standard model. What did I do? Okay. Um, so uh, going back to um, to precision measurement experiments, one other cool or actually a feature is um, that if you are swimming in this dark matter sea, then you, and suppose like, you know, we breathe in dark matter and everybody gets bigger and smaller at this cosine. And one could argue that, sure, I am getting bigger and smaller at this cosine omega t, but also my ruler is getting bigger and smaller at cosine omega t. So how do I know that, that there is this physical effect um, of, let's say, things getting bigger and smaller? Uh, which is the signal for scalar dark matter, um, that like how how do how would I measure it? One has to think very carefully about such weak forces kind of affecting everything in in our lab and think about how how does it interact like differently? How does your ruler interact differently with dark matter than with you? So a classic example would be the Michelson Morley experiment where, the drag of the ether was different in this direction versus this direction. So one has to design a differential or interferometric scheme to look for weak forces because of something like this. And because I like to think about ultralight dark matter as ether, I, I, yeah, you can, you have to kind of design something like that. So there's a variety of quantum and classical systems that are being used or have been proposed to, um, to constrain dark matter. And I encourage you guys to read this review put together by Marianne Sakhpanova and me and like 60 other people. I will focus on mechanical resonators. Um, there are many papers about using mechanic or mechanic and looking for a mechanical signal from um, wave-like dark matter. This is not a complete list, but I, I will focus on the two from my group, which were about scalar dark matter and vector dark matter, constraining them using optomechanical systems. So and this is something I've been using as an example 
um, because of time constraints, I can't tell you why, but uh, linear couplings between a uh, scalar field, which could be dark matter, and um, a mass of the electron or the, the Faraday tensor, so your electromagnetic field, can be modeled as um, variation in the mass of the electron or change in alpha. And these things will affect the Bohr radius because so you can think if you if you have a stick made up of atoms and each atom and the so each atom is getting bigger or smaller at this frequency that has to do with the dark matter frequency or mass. Then if you have a ruler, so a macroscopic object made up of these atoms, your the ruler is going to get bigger or smaller if it's sitting in this uh, sea of dark matter. Furthermore, if this um, this breathing frequency is at a resonance frequency of your ruler, so a breathing mode of your ruler, this effect would be even more amplified. So you can really constrain um, whether such a dark matter field is around you. So typical dark matter. Um, Plots, I call them scooping plots because we don't know the x-axis, which is the mass of dark matter and the corresponding frequencies are above. And we don't know uh, the y-axis. So in this case is coupling to the electron mass. So we don't know what the coupling is to normal matter in this specific case, electron mass, but we have some constraints. So, so um, fifth force measurements have provided these broadband constraints. And so, you know, we kind of like know that it must be below this. So this, um, so there's been a bunch of experiments mostly related to these spacer cavities where you're monitoring the cavity frequency. And uh, because the, the spacer in the cavity would get bigger or smaller due to its interaction with such ultralight scalar dark matter, one can constrain um, this coupling. And uh, so, so there's like a bunch of experiments here. I want you to focus on this one, which was because of Origa, um, which is a few ton aluminum Weber bar. And that tells you the advantage and disadvantage of using mechanical systems. So you can see that it really it, uh, a mechanical system at resonance can probe very weak couplings between normal matter and dark matter. However, it can only do that over a very narrow range of frequencies. So what we did was to extend this idea to a variety of mechanical systems in existence. So from superfluid helium, a little like cup of superfluid helium to nanopillars that were actually centimeter scale big. So centipillars uh, to quartz bulk acoustic wave resonators and showed that these um, all these mechanical systems can be used to constrain um, ultralight dark matter, scalar ultralight dark matter, specifically coupling to either alpha or the mass of the electron. Um, so I want to draw uh, attention to one of um, those experiments, which we named Helios, because every dark matter experiment has to have like an acronym. Uh, it is superfluid helium-based ultralight dark matter optomechanical sensor. So the, the ruler here is, uh, is, a, is a dub of ultralight, um, sorry, superfluid helium. And the cool thing about using acoustic modes of superfluid helium is because it's a liquid, one can tune, um, one can change the pressure in the container, which changes the acoustic resonance frequency without sacrificing the Q factor. So you can do like a scanning measurement because the signal frequency is unknown. Ideally, we would like to have a scanning detector, which is the kind of stuff people at ADMX, for example, do. So all heloscope experiments are resonant scanning experiments. So one can design something like ADMX style scanning detector using mechanical systems made of superfluid helium. Another type of, uh, so if ultralight dark matter, instead of being a scalar particle, like field of scalar particles, if it was a spin one particle, um, then um, couplings between this and, and normal matter can, would lead to a differential acceleration signal. 
So one thinks about it as um, as a, as a little bit like like Coulomb law. So so think about it as uh, as 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 photons. Um, and uh, you know you you couple to positive and negative charges. And it doesn't have to be electric charge for dark matter photon like particle, but instead it could be something else. Um, like baryon number or baryon minus lepton number, which have been accidental symmetries in, um, actually B minus L is an accidental symmetry in the standard model. And, uh, and one would have, one could have this type of coupling. So if you have, you know, a mass on spring-like system, which is made of the same thing, then it's just accelerated in a field of dark matter. But if you have something composed of two different materials, then you have a differential acceleration signal, which is something you can measure depending on the charge to mass ratio of whatever the equivalent of electric charge is here. And uh, the signal for the more would be amplified on acoustic resonance. So we looked at um, um, mass made of silicon nitride, which is coupled to a beryllium mirror, so an optomechanical system made of that. And one can indeed um, narrow in a narrow band way, can add new constraints to or detect ultralight dark matter because nothing is a single mode harmonic oscillator. One e actually has access to multiple higher order modes and one can use them to constrain um, a vector ultralight dark matter. Um, so these experiments are looking for scalar ultralight dark matter, vector ultralight dark matter using strain or acceleration. They are not easy. There's, um, you, know, you have to, they, the strains are about 10 minus 20, the accelerations 10 minus 12 meter per second square per root hertz. Uh, so these are difficult experiments, but there are a variety of systems that are kind of rising to the challenge. And I encourage you guys to read this review to know more about mechanical sensing of ultralight dark matter. Actually, there's some stuff about particle like dark matter as well. If you want to zoom out a little bit, there's a lot more systems than mechanical systems, a variety of AMO systems that can also be used to constrain dark matter. And as part of our white paper, we produce these parameter space curves, and I'm happy to share those with you, or you can look them up. Um, and uh, OK, so this was uh, pretty much everything I wanted to say about dark matter. Um, before I switch gears, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat, but I have one. Okay. You talk about the mechanical resonance enhancing your sensitivity, but I'm used to thinking now in terms of the force noise floor from like thermal force noise as being the ultimate limits. And if you yes. have a good enough cavity, you can detect way off resonance and then divide by the susceptibility and get just the noise floor being flat or having yes. like a one over F thing. Yes. So why doesn't this kind of thinking apply in this situation? It does. I kind of used, um, so thank you. This is a, you, I think this is a separate, much longer conversation to constrain. Um, so my goal in these papers was to show um, reasonable, almost existing or near-term resonators and in precision noise to, and, and the, the little needles that I have, they are limited by the thermal noise for, and the upstairs flat line, that's the mostly due to imprecision noise. Um, so this, okay. uh, yeah, so, so, so those are, are the limits here. One could design things, and I believe LIGO people are doing that, where this floor, sorry, here or, or here is below the EP bounds. Um, yeah, but, like this is what we're working on in our lab. That's why I was asking, is we're trying to get yeah. the, you know, shot noise limited readout of from zero to like megahertz. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I think we should talk about it. I think there is potential to have broadband limits uh, by, um, by using mechanical systems. Because the big advantage of mechanical systems over AMO systems is that we have a lot of mass. So that's, um, you know, that's why we need like bigger and bigger particle detectors. So you're never looking at dark matter, you're looking at dark matter coupling with normal matter. So if you have a lot of normal matter compared to a few atoms uh, <laughs> that are very well isolated, then um, you have a bigger signal. 
film. So I think they are, mechanical systems are uniquely suited, uh, well suited for these beyond standard model kind of tasks. Okay, any more questions? All right, well, thank you. This is, uh, I'm having fun. Okay, so um, this is more recent work in my group. Uh, I took a bit of a detour and decided to focus on this other 72% of the universe we don't know of because I was like, oh, it can also be modeled as a scalar field. Um, so that there's, uh, anyway, uh, so, so we don't know what 72% uh, of our universe is made of. We know even less about dark energy than we do about dark matter. And there's pretty much no direct detection experiments for dark energy because the local dark energy density, if it was a particle, is six orders of magnitude smaller than dark matter. So it's just very difficult to look at it using well, anything. Um, but we know um, from accelerated expansion of the universe that there is some weird you know, energy density fluid with negative pressure. And uh, the cool thing about dark energy or the bizarre thing about dark energy is that if I have a box of dark energy and the universe gets bigger, so the box gets twice as big, um, the energy doesn't get halved. It's a constant energy density. So the energy keeps increasing as the universe expands. And it has only been in the last like four some billion years. So as long as Earth has existed that we have lived in a universe that has been, whose energy budget has been ex, um, dominated by dark energy. So it's, it's an interesting time from a cosmological perspective. Um, however, if you have something like this and you say, oh, I have a box and I have some modes in a box and a box gets bigger, then I have a lot more modes in this box and I'm just gonna add up all the zero point energy of uh, all of this and this would be a good candidate for dark energy. And if you do that, we realize that we are 120, we get an answer that is 120 orders of magnitude bigger than the observed um, number from um, accelerated expansions. We have no idea where to start. And uh, this is the cosmological constant problem and the root of many problems. Um, one can think of, so a simplest thing would be a, um, let's add a scalar particle on top of every other particle we know of. And if it is self-interacting, then it forms a fluid that can have negative pressure. So you will have a situation where galaxies will be pushed away from each other. And these fields are called quintessence fields. Um, and quintessence fields are characterized by a certain equation of state. So it does not solve the, uh, the cosmological constant problem. We still have this 120 plus uh, you know, orders of magnitude issue and we have to add it by hand. However, the advantage of using a quintessence field is that it gives us a knob that tells us, that gives us a way to kind of understand how dark matter could have, sorry, dark energy could have been a very small fraction of the universe's energy budget a while back and a dominant fraction of our energy budget now. So it gives us a knob to kind of change the, the, the fraction of energy as dark energy, which is interesting. It was a constant, then it's like, why is it this? Um, Okay, however, um, if we have a scalar field that causes the observed accelerated expansion of the universe, it would also mediate forces between um, two objects. And this is like the Coulomb law situation. And um, it would do so at a rate that would have been observed in any fifth force experiment. So there would be deviations from GMM over R square if I try to measure that between Earth and Moon or between two balls in the lab. And these um, situations have been very well constrained using astro measurements or lab measurements. So it cannot be, um, so to, to kind of reconcile uh, this beautiful theory of let's add one scalar field. And uh, well, I didn't see it in the lab. One uh, solution 
was to add a, a new term to the potential that screens this field. So what if um, apart from this uh, phi field coupling, so you have some power law um, situation going on in your potential, you also have a term that depends on local dark matter density. So you would, between galaxies where there is basically no matter, um, this field does what it's supposed to and causes accelerated expansion of the universe. But between in your lab, when there where there is a lot of um, normal matter, this field is screened um, significantly. So whether it is two balls in the lab or Earth or Moon, this uh, field is screened and in you know in the middle of nowhere it does its thing. And so because of this screening term. Uh, that depend on local matter density, so your environment, these fields are known as chameleon fields. And um, and I, in my group, we worked on designing uh, fifth force uh, experiments based on mechanical systems uh, to look for deviations from GMM over R square kind of term that depend on these screening factors, which could be one or less. Um, they had, and, and it's a variety of things. It depends on how big your vacuum is, what are the materials it's made of, what is the local, the density. So in, in this specific case, we wanted to have nice analytical solution to see different scalings and stuff. And this is the chameleon force. Um, so we, we looked at if you had two spheres in a spherical vacuum chamber, this would be the expression for your force. For more complicated geometries, you can use uh, numerical softwares like COMSOL to solve this differential equation. So, okay. And then I thought of two spherical mechanical systems. So you can have a small torsion balance or a levitated microsphere uh, close to, let's say, a spherical um, gold source mass. And uh, you, these expressions should apply and, and do apply um, to these these experiments and we showed that using um, either these gold torsion balances um, gram scale uh, torsion balances kind of like millimeter away from each other or um, levitated microspheres close to a, a source mass um, and these two experiments operating at their currently demonstrated sensitivities we can rule out a vast chunk of these uh, chameleon theories. Um, in fact, so this uh, space had been constrained previously by either atom interferometry or uh, the torsion balance experiments in Eertwash. And my intuition into going into this problem was that if I have these optomechanical systems, which was my PhD work, they, it's a lot more mass than atom interferometry, which is modeled as a you know femtometer scale sphere of nuclear matter density. So eventually things get screened because of very high density, or um, these centimeter scale like parallel plates that are moving uh, like this with respect to each other, and uh, because they are big, there is a lot of screening there. So so something smaller like millimeter centimeter scale should be able to rule out. Um, chameleons as dark energy over an astrophysically interesting uh, parameter space. And that is what we found. In general, from our analytical results, we found that if you want to probe weaker coupling between normal matter and such chameleon fields, one will have to use larger masses, which again causes uh, screening. So there's a little bit of um, optimization there. And if you want to look at weaker self-interaction, so if you let go of the fact that chameleon is dark energy and has this specific uh, self-interaction rate on, and say that one has a screened scalar field that may or may not be dark energy, then, and if you want to look for such a field, one needs to have mechanical systems with better and better sensitivity to kind of go, you know, vertically down, so probe weaker sensitive, um, weaker self-interaction strengths, um, and uh, so these uh, these kind of analytical curves depend on a few parameters: your background uh, pressure, uh, when sc screening takes over your your 
the the size of the two balls, the density of the two balls and stuff, and I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, then we kind of put it together, um, put these projected constraints and experimental constraints with constraints from um, if you assume you have a low energy, you know, effective field theory, quantum corrections are small. And if, um, if you assume safe cosmological evolution, so if these couplings are stronger than a certain, they, they must be weaker than, um, the coupling to normal matter must be weaker than a certain number because otherwise it would uh, disrupt uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So then you arrive at this intersection of blue and yellow area. And uh, I think that these can be targeted by mechanical systems, um, bigger mechanical systems operating in the quantum regime. So it's an interesting, exciting time um, in my field. I would like to think of furthermore. Um, obviously, uh, not everything is a sphere, and uh, most mechanical systems are not spherically symmetric, but there is a straightforward way to numerically go from um, these, uh, to numerically find out the force between two objects due to this uh, chameleon um, field. And uh, they should be able to constrain a much broader um, segment of this uh, parameter space that has not been ruled out either by astrophysics or by um, lab constraints. So I hope I convinced you that existing and near-term optomechanical systems have the sensitivity required to look for dark matter or dark energy. And I just want to take a moment to say that these are not easy experiments and they shouldn't be. If it was that easy, we would have known more about dark matter and dark energy. So uh, just to get a feel for numbers, if you're trying to constrain um, scalar coupling between, uh, you know, correction um, modulations to the electron mass for uh, one kilohertz or so oscillator, you're looking at strain sensitivity of 10 to the minus 20. Um, if you are trying to add new constraints to, let's say, B minus L coupled vector dark matter, you're looking for 10 minus 11 um, meter per second square of acceleration sensitivity at a kilohertz. And there's some similar numbers for chameleon dark energy. It's so um, geometry de dependent that I didn't write it down. These are heroic experiments. One has to make sure you know, that the ruler is well-defined <laughs> um, from the system. And you may not believe that we're swimming in a galactic scale BC, or there's these weird chameleon fields that become meek in the presence of normal matter and push galaxies away from each other when nobody's watching. Um, but I'd like to... Um, inspire the next generation with a very old experiment, the Michelson-Morley experiment, where there was a theoretical prediction, which is the dashed line here. And the experimental result was that flat line that they found, and they did not see what they were looking for. And it is by not seeing the signal that we have a much better understanding of what light is. And I think that that a couple of people, especially in, in optomechanics, mechanics have been like, yeah, but there's no signal to measure. And, and this is my answer to, to all of them that even not seeing a signal is, is exciting because it'll help us come up with the theory for dark matter and dark energy. So that's my hope. And I would like to say thank you to all of you for listening. And I'd like to say special thank you to the students who who kind of turned my light bulbs into actual you know, calculations and papers. And uh, you are welcome to read more about it in these papers. And uh, I'm looking for a postdoc in case somebody is interested. I also wanna say thank you to Daniel Grin, who has been a collaborator on these projects and brings insight. He's an astrophysicist with interest in cosmology. And so he brings unique insight into my quantum optics. Um, girl kind of uh, background. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that cool talk, Swati. Um, 
hard to do virtually, but uh, sure. everybody agrees. Um, if there's any questions, I think oh, there's a hand up already. Enjoy your talk. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, um, this is completely new to me. This this type of field. So I have a, maybe a naive question. So how is it that like a a, a dark field can couple to gravity? Is that true? The graviton, just like uh, um, ENM, can be is modified by the presence of other particles in the standard model, or is that something I'm missing here? Uh, no. Um, okay. Um, so for dark matter, we know about dark matter from its gravitational effects. So one can, so my, um, if dark matter is concentrated in a gram scale object, 100 gram scale object, which is the, you know, the, the dark matter density over the size of the earth, then you should be able to just, you know, detect it from gravitationally. One doesn't have to assume any non-gravitational coupling, which is what we assume in every direct detection experiment. So there is some work going on trying to see dark matter from purely its gravitational interaction, which is the only thing we know about dark matter, right? So, so there's always two assumptions that every dark matter experiment makes. One is that all the dark matter around me is exactly the same mass that I'm looking for. And B, it interacts with normal matter using, you know, some, some and there's some phenomenology uh, that goes into it but using this specific coupling channel. Does that answer your question, at least for dark matter? Uh, I've still, that, I mean, maybe a related question. Yeah. Would that mean that the uh, initial mass would be different than the gravitational mass or uh, inertia. Inertia, inertial mass? Being yeah, 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 no, 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 no. Um, Would it? I don't think so. No, no, okay. no. Yeah. It's just so, it's so, so this would be a situation where let's say dark matter is a sprinkle of asteroids, right? So I, I would not see them or brown dwarfs or something. So I did not see light from them. Right. But they are around, right? If if dark matter is something like this now, an asteroid or a brown dwarf or something like that, we we can, you know, your detector on Earth. My point is like that that you can see from like lensing or or right. you know that, that's what I mean. Okay, so okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, we have time for more questions if there are any. I actually have one. So um, you did these calculations for detecting dark energy by bringing two things near each other. And how big of a problem is Casimir in those experiments? Or like trap trap drivers will of course be yeah. Thing, but, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now you're not looking for you know GMM over R square. Casimir is definitely an issue, but our, uh, if you're look, uh, so what our results showed, like typically you're looking for new particles that are this, that has this Yukawa potential. So you, you want things to be very close to each other so that you can like see corrections because of this exponential tail. And uh, what we showed is that these are not like short range corrections to Newtonian gravity. If you, this is a scalar field, uh, screen scalar field is not exactly a, cor correct, a short range correction to gravity, which is the style of a lot of these experiments where this would become important. So for example, for the two systems we looked at, um, these, oh great, I don't have the numbers here. Um, so they were millimeter or more, which is a, a, a a range where Casimir is is not an issue. Um, we shall re-raise uh, their hands. Yes, so. that is uh, that that would be me in this case. 
And that's going to be another naive question because even though physically I'm close to researchers in dark matter studies, uh, literally, and uh, mentally I'm, I'm far removed from this subject. Um, so it is my understanding that one big uh, indication for dark matter is the uh, rotational speeds of galaxies. Yes. But we have rotational speeds of our planets, and we also have very accurate uh, positional movement versus time for uh, some of the probes that were sent out, like the pioneers that actually had anomalies in their accelerations. And uh, so has that been looked at in the context of dark matter? In other words, is the squirrel, uh, the upper limit of dark matter that we can have given the pioneer anomaly and the movement of the planets or, or how, where are where do we stand in this matter? Um, I have seen one or two papers recently emerge. I actually could one of you send me an email. I, I would love to have a, a longer discussion about this. I'm also learning. I think, yeah. So um, I, I don't know. This is a very good. So that's my easy answer. I don't know exactly. I have skimmed at a few papers. I'm not sure. I'm not aware of the Pioneer experiment. So I would I would love to learn about it. Thank you. Yeah. But but it is it, it is interesting. I think there's some constraints from these kind of corrections. I've seen it for the chameleon, which also looked for you no know, corrections for GMM over R square. Um, but I am not. I don't think they were from this experiment. So, so yeah, thank you. Is, is there a possibility that actual gravitation is a stronger interaction than we think, but that there's dark matter with negative mass everywhere except where it is not? Oh, uh, people have these kind of funky ideas for dark <laughs> energy. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't think so, but uh, but now like like I have no proof, right? So, so yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps I better stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love to chat more with you about all these uh, these uh, semi philosophical ideas. So the, so the the I think if you're from dark matter, this is wave like dark matter, you know, axions. Um, the only thing is, instead of having a pseudo-scalar field, uh, what I'm saying is, what if it's a scalar field or a vector field? And then a wide range of classical and quantum systems can be used to kind of probe these couplings. They have the existing sensitivity to probe these couplings. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I guess I feel it's important to end on the dumbest questions. So let me ask, how do you know, you kind of assume that it's behaving like a cosine, but when I think of particles, I think of e to the i, omega t, and minus kx, and stuff like that. Um, are you just assuming there's standing waves or something? Or how do you know that, that it's not a wave where the phase is evolving, but there's no change in you know, where the, where the, part of the probability density of a particle? Yeah, so these especially in the are, presence of circulation. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, this is a very good question. So, if you assume this um, thermalization mm -hmm. and stuff, which is the assumption in the standard halo model, then you have something that looks very much like a Maxwell Boltzmann like distribution of dark matter. And uh, so, there's a very specific signal um, line shape that you're looking for. Um, so if your detector bandwidth is bigger, then you can kind of see, and the line shape is very important because it tells me about the way dark matter must have, you know, um, um, equilibrated in, in our galaxy. And from especially like Gaia data, we know that our galaxy is totally not at equilibrium. So another galaxy kind of merged into our galaxy uh, between you know here and the last time we were here. So this is definitely not thermal. We expect there to be streams. And if that galaxy had some dark matter, there'll be a stream of dark matter kind of coming in. So this Maxwell distribution would have you know corrections to it and there are corrections to it. My point is there is a line shape that tells us about the astrophysics of dark matter. And this is 
across experiments. So also this is applicable to WIMPs as well. Um, that tells us about um, our, our our galactic history of dark matter, um, and uh, and it's that is the the smoking gun signal that that you're looking for. So it's not just the cosine; it's uh, the moments of the cosine. You have to look for not just the mean, but also like a few moments to kind of really know. And yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a last question? Well, if not, let's thank Swati uh, again for the nice talk and discussion at the end.